And um, that was the first time in my life I knew what it was to cry tears of joy. Wow. And so um, that night I went home and I wrote these words in my journal. I now believe all human beings have the capacity for positive change and growth, no matter what, no matter who. And um, that became my core philosophy. And the reason that, back to your main question, is why don't I give up? And has I, uh, or have I had moments where I wanted to give up? And why haven't I? Is because my core philosophy. I believe it. The more um, I prove myself right by working with people whose lives have actually changed, and the more my life continues to change for the better, the more I am motivated to continue to go. And yes, I've had some disappointing moments. I've worked with kids, I've mentored them. I used to be a orientation coordinator for a job corps. And there I met some challenged kids who had, who were at risk, gang members and things like that. Kids from you know, households where the parents were on drugs and things that, and fathers in prison for years and they've never met their father, so on and so forth. One of the guys I met, he, you know, I actually went over there to pick him up and take him to um, Bible study with me one night, and he told me, no, but I'm going to come Sunday, and Sunday is going to be my day, and I'm changing my life that day. Mm -hmm. So he, that uh, I got about a block away and heard gunshots, and he died. Wow. He, he was shot in the back of his head with an AK-47, and, um, and his name was Antoine, and um, I never will forget him because I ended up having to speak at his funeral. And the, the day that his funeral took place, I was, that was the day I d decided that I was giving up. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to work with another kid again. And then I bought myself a Sprite and I opened the cap on it and the cap said, please try again. Mm. I still got that soda top to this day, okay. and it's been many years now, about, I guess about 14 years ago, and I keep looking at that soda cap, and it keeps telling me to keep trying. So, you're having, you're being motivated and having the need, or knowing that there's a need to help others, keeps you, is one thing that keeps you going. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you this? What advice would you give to someone that, what advice do you give to not give up to those that feel hopeless and just throwing in the towel and say, I can't take it anymore. I'm not going to be successful. I'm not going to reach my goals. I'm not going to make it to where I want to go. What advice do you give for them not to give up? Well, I give it, I give some, it's, it, it, it's sometimes it comes across kind of harsh because I know how people become emotionally attached to their excuses. And wow. so I know that because I've been that person. So explain that. Emotionally people become attached. emotionally attached to their excuses to the point that their excuse becomes their security blanket Ooh. and it keeps them comforted in not achieving greatness. And so they use whatever the reasons and excuses and all of that that they come up with as to why they, they, they haven't achieved any greatness, why they haven't lived their dreams, why they haven't went after their goals. They keep using that over and over and over again. And then when someone comes and speaks against it and tell them, you know, you can, this is possible, and I can tell you how to overcome the obstacle, so if I just actually defeated their excuse, then I have actually awakened an angry person. Yes. People are mad at me for taking their excuses away. <laughs> it does. It happens when I take an excuse away from somebody. And the main way I do it is by sharing with them stories of people who have similar challenges. Because here's the truth. Everybody who wants to be someone greater has to go through a series of challenges. That's Every bad. one of us. You, there's no way around it. Yes. The harder the diamond, the more brilliant the sparkle, which means it had to go through more pressure to bring it out. And so you have a, a, a Mandela who became president of South Africa, but you wouldn't have 
President Mandela without 27 years of Nelson Mandela, the prisoner, Amen. who was the, uh, the freedom fighter against apartheid. And so his imprisonment you know, made him and prepared him for the presidency. And so I, wanted, I, I tell people all the time that you, know, you might be going through a wilderness experience right now, but just on the other side of this mountain is the promised land. So I tell people all the time, you know, just keep on going. Now, I like to share a story that I share often that there's this guru, okay. right, who's sitting along <laughs> the roadside, and along comes this young warrior who has decided that he's tired of fighting for a living, and he wanted to know how to find great success and happiness in life. And so he went up to this guru and said, man, you well known. I know that you can tell me where success is. How can I find happiness in life? And the guru said, I'll be glad to show you. I know exactly where it is. It's right over that way. And he pointed towards what looks to be, look like, you know, a thicket, a bunch of trees and woods. And so the young man said, are you sure? He said, I'm positive. And he headed off and he ran into the woods and not far into the woods, you heard a loud splat. And then the young man came back. He was a little bit scratched up. He said, hey, I went that way and got splatted. Are you sure it's that way? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, it's that way. So he went back and ran back into the woods. And then you heard after a while a, a double splat, splat. And then the young man came back. And he was bleeding and his clothes was ripped up and he's breathing hard. He's infuriated. He's upset. He says to the guru, you old fool. I went that way and all I keep getting is splatted. I demand you tell me where success is. And then the guru said, success is that way. He said, well, where? He said, just on the other side of splat. Mm. Just on the other side. Just on the other side of splat. And so right when you come to the edge of a thing, it becomes more difficult. I'd like to share one more example. Go ahead. And so um, here's Jesus walking on the water, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the disciples in the ship. And so here's Peter saying, if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. Peter stepped out of the boat, and the scripture records him walking on the water. When he gets... Uh, so far into the water and walking on the water in the middle of a storm suddenly the wind starts blowing louder uh, or harder and it's howling and the waves are slapping against him and the scripture said he turned in to look at the storm and um, he began to sink then it says he cried out Lord save me and then the master stuck his hand out and pulled him to safety and they made it to the ship. What intrigues me is what most people miss mm -hmm. is that Peter said, save me. And all Jesus did was reach his hand out and mm -hmm. pulled him to safety, mm -hmm. which means he was within arm's length of his goal and things grew worse. Right. And his attention went from where he was headed to what was going on around wow. him. And so the biggest problem that I see people having in achieving their goals is instead of keeping their eyes as we say cliche in, 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 a, in a cliche fashion keep you, keeping your eyes on the prize right. what people do is focus on things that are happening around them and so Booker T. Washington said that the circumstances that surround you are not important but how you respond to them is and ultimately it is the determining factor in your success or failure and whatever you endeavor to do in life yes Yes, very true, very true. So. Okay, I'm almost done. A couple of more questions. What's your why? And I got this from you. What's your motivation? What is your why? Why do you do what you do? Why do you push yourself every day? Why are you up um, to 2, 3 in the morning? Hmm. When things, and I, and I know personally that you have experienced some things that would make other people say, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm never going to do this again. Financial losses, um, creating things and creating, um, I guess, businesses. And I'll just put it out there to have it snatched away from you. <clears throat> Those are things that, that you have dealt with. But what is your 
main why and your motivation again to just keep you going? Very good question. And you know what? It's true that you know if your why doesn't make you cry, it's not big enough. Because mm. I've been a motivator for uh, uh, I, you know since '93, and I found out that I, I've never actually motivated anybody. And all these years, what I discovered is all I can do is inspire motivation. And it comes from within. Yeah. And so when it comes to me, my why has to do with uh, my children. Uh, I have seven children. Four of them I made and um, three of them God blessed me to, to have in my life to raise. And so they all mine. And my why includes my mother, who um, has, you know, who, who who doesn't have an incredible retirement laid up for her. She's not retiring wealthy. My why includes my brother, who has uh, taken ill, has to have hip replacement and several other things. He's on so many medications, and he can't even afford the things that um, he has to have just to keep him alive. My why includes. The young men that I see on the corner when I'm driving down the street, if I ride through a, a neighborhood that's an unsavory place and I see people just hanging on the corner, then you know I'm um, stirred inside and I have to continue and I have to fight as hard as I can. My why is my church is so many things that I would like to see happen in my church. I will, I want and I want to see ministries born that. Uh, there's a vision at our church for um, young mothers who are struggling and single and trying to make it with their kids. I like to see us opening up safe houses for them and places of hope. Uh, my why includes helping men who are homeless to move from homelessness to hopefulness. And um, it, it's, it's huge and it keeps getting bigger and bigger all the time. And so these things are what motivates me and has nothing to do with money. I've never actually been money motivated. I've always been mission motivated. And my mission is to explore, realize, and promote um, duplicable strategies for extraordinary human achievement and to teach and empower and to inspire others to maximize their life's potential. And so that is my why. And my mission fuels my fire. It keeps me going. And that's why I keep rising from the ashes. I rise from the ashes of depression. I will rise from the ashes of brokenness. I will rise from the ashes of uh, you know, messed up relationships. Uh, I rise from the ashes of you know, abandonment. A betrayal and all of the other things that can happen to a person who's trying to live their dreams because I realize that I'm walking in the footsteps of the greatest people of all time so yeah there's money attached to the things that I do but right. the but everything that I want to accomplish requires some money yes I, and that's the case <laughs> for so many people we I, I hate to say it but you know um, we need money to do what we want to do and money in order to help others um, to, as you say, accomplish your dreams. That's right. Okay, in closing, I'd like to ask, and um, I want you to share with our listeners, <clears throat> pardon me, what legacy do you want to leave before you leave this earth? My legacy. What legacy do I want to leave? Yes. It's a real deep question for me, and uh, you know, so we want to you know bring my kids back into the picture, and so I want my kids to be able to say their name, and people ask them, "Are you related to James Dickerson?" Okay. If my son Isaiah says, "My name's Isaiah Dickerson," I want people to say, "You wouldn't happen to be related to James Dickerson." <laughs> <laughs> Now, somebody, you know, some religious, pious person might want to make me feel bad about having that desire for my name to be great like that. Right. But my desire for that greatness in my name really has more to do with 
the dignity that my family will enjoy in the future. The family that I'll never even get to know. Right. My great great grandchildren. Henry Ford's great great grandchildren know his name. John D. Rockefeller's great great grandchildren know his name. And there's countless others whose family know their name, who have big portraits of them up in every one of their homes, and they all celebrate the legacy of that person who did something incredible that changed the course of history for that family. Yes. And my legacy is you know, the, the legacy of the Bible, which says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So I know that I have to leave some things here that are tangible, that are real, that have that can be fondled and touched, some things that can be experienced. So I'm not just, you know, taking everything with me. So I'm leaving my thoughts here. My legacy is my mind. Everything that I've learned through the years, I'm scrambling now to make sure that I get it recorded in writing and on audios and on videos. I want Every, I mean, if the if the internet is the future and it's in its infant stage now, yes. and somebody might be listening to this audio, um, this interview, a hundred years from now, yes. and if you are listening to a hundred years from now, you know, you have no idea of how primitive the stuff that we're using right now looks to you. <laughs> <laughs> but the the things that we're using now won't be the things they use in the future. But one thing's for sure. When some hits the internet, it never disappears. Yes, and never, so ever. my legacy is that I conquered the internet in this infant stage. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. People, let me <laughs> share this with you, okay? <laughs> Years ago, when the internet, in, in, in its infancy, James was at the library, and all the other kids, little kids were on the internet. He's like, I, I, I'll never get this little kids one. I can't even get it. <laughs> and we laugh about that because now he does web design. He knows so much and he's teaching me so much. But it's funny, years ago we laughed about it. He was afraid to uh, tackle the internet and the computer. And now he is a guru. And we'll talk about that in some other um, um, interviews with social networking and, and, and media networking and using the internet for profit and just to reach people. I just wanted to share that about Mr. Super Fantastic. Um, well, James, it's been a great interview and I thank you for your insightfulness and, and, and your good um, words and everything that you brought to us. And again, uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to inviting you back again soon. We're going to touch on some other things. Um, in closing, I just want to thank you for um, tuning in to the phoenixunleashed.com. And please return to um, look forward to more interviews with other great people um, that are making changes and becoming the phoenix or the, their phoenix. Thank you so much, Eliani. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And for those who want to get in touch with me, you can always find me on Facebook. Um, just Google my name if you want or again go to any social media any social network and become my friend or you know like me on Facebook do something like that you can stay plugged into what we're doing next there's a lot of incredible things that we're about to unfold again thanks for um, visiting the Phoenix have a great day great evening wherever you are and again remember our